what is a slur? Because you describe defining them as somewhat thorny in its own right. So how do they differ from other pejoratives that you're less focused on in this book? That's funny because you think you're starting over with the easy question. You're actually starting with the hardest question. <laughs> Nobody has an answer to that question. It's hilarious. If you look at the literature, no one ever actually tells you what, what is a slur. They say, well, it's a pejorative expression to pick out groups of individuals on the basis of religion or politics or sexual preferences and things of that sort. That's the best they can do. That's a, it's hardly what you okay. call definition. So it's an interesting fact that literature carries on without any definition of the key term, without any real... Some people have said there is between pejorative expressions and slur terms and uh, as a subclass is that the other pejoratives are based on individual properties that individuals might have. Whereas with slurs, when you use a slur, you talk about a group of individuals and you tie them all together. So when you slur one person who's an X, you're slurring all the X's, right? That's the claim. Uh, Robin Cheshire has a paper when she says this is very murky, and I, I tend to agree with her. It's a very murky distinction. It's not clear where where individual stops and, and group starts or where groups starts and and individuals stop and so on. It's very murky. It turns out you can write a lot about this literature without having an answer to that question. Not surprisingly, I guess. You don't have to. Well, you, as long as you know when you have one, that's good enough. Even if you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, methodologically, I guess before we get into some of the content of the book, though, I think this actually does come up a bit in the introduction. But methodologically, how do you go about or deal with? the task of writing philosophically about slurs when it's extraordinarily risky or dangerous to token them. So some some philosophers, like, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I mean, sometimes even just trying to explicate them, what they mean without saying them could be uh, found offensive to some people. And we don't have to go into what's going on with Oxford university press right now. And, um, I think you, you might have mentioned that there's a, a whole hubbub about uh, speech and offensive terms. So I, it's just very much in the air right now. So I'm curious about how you deal with that in this book. Incidentally, I liked how you used the word uh, mudblood from <laughs> Harry Potter. That's how I deal with it. Effect. So uh, um, interesting enough, um, and I'm dealing with it more than most people want to do it. So Liz, for example, thinks if you, Tim Williamson, Liz, most people who write on the topic, think if you put quote marks, on a slur term, it's okay to use the quote quoted expression. That doesn't carry with it all the bad feelings that are associated with the assertion of the expression, or the use of the expression. So they, they draw the distinction between mentioning a slur term and using a slur term. Tim Williams is very adamant about this, and that if people are offended by the mention of a slur term, they're, they're confused. They have a use mention confusion. I don't buy it that way at all. I think that... Oh, really? No, I believe that the mentions are very bad. Uh, in fact, Randall Kennedy, who wrote a book, a National Book Award, for his book, uh, the, N- he, the N-Word is the title of the book. Uh, and he and somebody who's a law professor at UCLA are writing a new edition, I think, or a sequel to it. And they wrote to me saying, look, you yourself have said that quoted slur terms are pernicious. And we agree. Uh, but you quote them all the time in your paper. And I, I said, I did. And I was... They had my, my first paper. So I wrote a paper in the aughts with, with a then graduate student, now professor, tenure professor at Syracuse named Lavelle Anderson. And Yeah, he's been on the show. Lavelle is African American. And I think yeah. he lulled yeah. me into he lulled me into thinking it was okay to quote these expressions, which it's not. Certainly not for me at least. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you're gonna get you're gonna get the same now you could just say it's a theoretical that there's a huge theoretical confusion in the community at large, but if you have a way of explaining the data without attributing false beliefs, to, uh, you know, confusions and belief, false beliefs to others, you, I think that's preferable. So what I'm now offering is an account of why the, the, uh, the quoted expressions or the example expressions. So for example, a lot of philosophers think that in a pedagogical context, you can quote these expressions without offending anybody or you, they shouldn't be offended. Or in a, in a play or a movie, some artwork in general, you can quote these expressions without offending people or they should not be offended, things of that sort. Um, Liz is one of them. Uh, I find that people get squeamish, even if you're quoting them. 
no, or, or if you're putting in, in a kind of meaning context, like X means X means quote X means X. Imagine you're replacing X with a star term. There, you're not using the star term. You're kind of you're not mentioning it. You mention it in one part, but the other part you're kind of quasi using it. When you're describing a meaning to the expression, people would still find it offensive. Now, you could argue that they're right. all confused. That's your theory. That's your theory. Your theory is that mentions of quotes are inoffensive. If anybody is offended, they're wrongly offended. They're confused. I find that, I find that not helpful. And I think I've made enemies over that because people think that if I challenge their views on this, I'm basically charging them with xenophobia. That I'm, I'm basically calling them with xenophobia because they're ignorant of the offenses. They could. I think the simplest way to see this is that there are two ways to cause pain, right? You can cause pain. That's, that's downstream, but up, upstream, you can also, you can, uh, you know, it might be a reaction. So I might, I might think hard about what you said and conclude that it was, it was a mistake for you to have said it, but I might still be stung. So you might use the N word in front of me in the context of a uh, teaching it, and, or it might be you're ignorant. You just said, no, you're a foreign speaker. You didn't know this was a bad word in English. So you speak this word and I might say, Oh, I'm stung, right? So I hear it, I'm in pain, I suppose. But from that doesn't follow you did anything wrong. That's downstream, right? That's much further down the list. They go through all the reasons. They say, well, you know, the guy didn't know what he was saying. Or it was a child. Child didn't appreciate the import of his expressions. Or it was a play. Or it was a, lo- it was a philosophy class. Something to that effect. Those might have impact on how you react after the visual pain. But the visual pain is there. And that can't be denied. I think what people are missing, which I think must, must be a common distinction in ethics, is the difference between the causal notion and the rationalistic intentional notion of pain. You know, there's, there's, the, there's the pain you receive from, from having witnessed someone do something immoral. And there's the pain you receive just from like someone punching in the face. And the, 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 what I'm talking about is the punch in the face, the sting that the start time provokes in you when you hear it, even if it's, or when you see it, even if it's in quotes. Right. Right. I There's a, uh, the distinction that comes to mind uh, when when you talk about when you mention Williamson's view that it it the use mention distinction and people are just confused and maybe maybe they shouldn't be offended but the fact of the matter is that uh, they are and maybe that's what is more important in practical considerations. I want to point out to you that there are lots of examples. I can give them to you some of them right now. This thing really rich about this literature, there are lots of real case examples where people have lost their jobs over these kinds of errors. So there's a famous example from Baltimore where a guy is speaking, uh, I think it's a city treasurer, some, someone, per, bursar, someone working for the city government involved with the finances. And um, he uses an adverb He's speaking to a largely black audience and he uses an adverb which means cheap. You know, it's the N word. Yeah, I know the adverb you're thinking yeah. of. And people go nuts. Now, initially, you could just say, well, they're confused. They, they, they thought that word was con- historically connected, so etymologically connected, some way connected, has no connection at all. Now, what's fascinating is that the reaction to this was, uh, you can imagine, a boatload of op eds. And uh, you, could, uh, you could pretty much tell the race of the author by the reaction. All the white authors said, what's going on? These people don't know any, they, they don't know any Latin or something. They don't know something that they, they knew they wouldn't have been offended. And you had a lot of black writers saying, well, let's see. There are 32 synonyms for this word in the OED. Why did he pick this one, which is how they ever use, no one ever uses this word. And he's talking to a larger black audience. Why didn't he think ahead? So it's suggesting his, his uh, either his intentions were not benign or he didn't think it through carefully when he said it. But here's the main point, though. Years later, like now, for example, the word's still tainted. It's tainted, even though everybody knows now it's not etymologically connected in any way, historically connected in any way to the actual N-word. But people prefer not to use that word. That word has become banished, if you like. So that's hard to explain. Another example is a guy at USC who was teaching uh, business English to, to Americans about Chinese, about Mandarin. They told him that the... the uh, the, you know, the, what's the correspondent to when, you, when you're thinking, so you don't remember what you have to say, you say, um, um, um. In, in Mandarin, they use the third person pronoun, the monster pronoun, that, the translation of it. So they go, that, 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 except it's pronounced the same as the N-word. 
that's just a boring fact about mm-hmm. Mandarin. In Mandarin, the third person, the mantra pronoun, is pronounced as uh, the N word. So he's teaching them this. He's, he begins the lesson by saying, I'm not going to talk about not English, but Mandarin. Here's the word in Mandarin. And people get freaked out. We said, I begged them to stop using it. And I don't know what happened to the guy, but I think there was some level of punishment. Uh, but the point being is that this is a case where people knew he wasn't speaking English. They knew he wasn't using the N word because this is not a, it's not a word, it's not a word in Chinese. And yet, uh, he got in trouble for it. Uh, they, they were stung. So that's a case. You might say they were all confused, but they knew, they knew what language the guy was teaching them in Mandarin. He wasn't teaching them English. And they knew the N word does not exist in Mandarin. Yet it sounded like it. So that's another kind of example. I go on and on with examples like this, but they're all examples that are intended to challenge the claim that people either are making use mention confusion or don't realize they're making use mention confusion. These are cases where they're not making use mention confusion. They couldn't possibly be making use mention confusion. <laughs>